This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. We've got a culturing process, a fermenting process, an aging process. So the butter will taste very different than, I guess, the average supermarket butter. Uh, I like to say we make butter makers butter. Like this is the sort of butter butter makers will would like to eat simply because of the slow process in which we ferment and age and, and get the flavour into it. You know, the natural fermentation that gets all the flavours into the cream and then once you churn it, you end up with this really rich, flavoursome butter that evolves and changes because it's a live culture that's in the butter as well. For more information, go to pepisaya.com.au. I've never worked in a bad kitchen and the best friends I've ever made have been people that I've met through food and there's just something about being behind the curtain in a restaurant and being the people that make it happen that just is really, really lovely and exhausting. (laughs) This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. There are some whose influence runs deep through the industry, others communicating en masse across the food media. But there are few that can manage both and have an innate ability to influence and enhance the minds, hearts, and sate the bellies of those that have the good fortune to break bread under their watch. Alex Herbert is one of Australia's best chefs and restaurateurs, and it's an absolute honour to have her on the show today. Alex, how are you? Well, now I'm wiping away the tears, but I'm good otherwise. <laughs> well, it's a it's an interesting time of year, especially for those that love food with a lot of festivities and, and Christmas. After the two years that we've had, how are you feeling about this this Christmas? Um, looking forward to it enormously. I think like everybody, there's sort of um, a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel, but I think everyone's still holding their breaths a bit because we live in such an under unpredictable world now, um, but we're keeping our small and close. So our expectations are quite limited, which will reduce any disappointments, hopefully. <laughs> You've had an incredible influence on the culinary landscape in, in all sorts of ways, from um, casual uh, food offerings to farmers markets to near the pointy end. Um, it's, it's been an incredible career. When did the interest in food start for you? I grew up in a family where um, food was important. My mother is and was a fantastic cook and um, all my aunts and my grandmother was a fantastic cook. I used to look forward to going and visiting my grandmother in Albury and um, there was always homemade chocolate ice cream or homemade strawberry ice cream in the freezer. And so, you know, from a long time ago, um, food has been really significant in terms of making memories and connecting to places for me. Is there any uh, dishes or feasts that you remember from when you were young that really sort of stick out for you as a fond memory? Well, funnily enough, I think the Christmas memories are the ones that really stand out because that's when we would go to Albury most years. And um, my grandmother lived in Albury, but my, all my aunts lived around. And we were always at one of the aunts' house and everyone came together and they were really big feasts. You know, there were 20 or 30 people. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, the traditional roasted turkey in the middle of summer out in the country, which I've completely steered away from after that experience. <laughs> but certainly, um, you know, that 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 feast and that celebration, um, even if, you know, you're not religious around Christmas, it's certainly still a time of coming together, which, you know, is spiritual in its own way. What was What was the lure for you? to begin a career in hospitality? Was it something that you always felt like doing? (laughs) It was an accident. (laughs) So I'd always loved 
food. And funnily enough, you know, I'd, I even at high school, I'd have a birthday party, but it would be me preparing the food. And I'd have dinner parties and do all the name places and write the menu out in French. And um, my dad would often entertain for work and I would help my mum and then actually eventually took over, you know, preparing these meals for these private corporate dinners and then I was at university and um, always waitressed the whole way through you know down at the Royal Automobile Club and in cafes in Balmain and there was a food shop at the back of the Balmain Institute building and I worked at Cafe Jules on Saturday mornings but there was a food shop and I started making tarts like an apple fiend tart from you know um, what was what was the book it was the um, uh, the Julia Child and Louise, Louise Bertol and Simone Beck, you know, mastering the art of French cooking. So it was kind of always there. And then, um, you know, I was at university doing an arts degree, majoring in history and Italian, and um, my heart was broken and I couldn't concentrate on study anymore. So I thought, you know, what do you do when your heart's been broken? You'd leave the country. Um, so I decided to start looking for um, places to go overseas. And I thought, oh, well, I've always liked cooking. And, you know, I've kind of understand restaurants. So started asking around people if they knew anywhere where perhaps I could, you know, go and work in a restaurant overseas. Very naive, very naive. Um, and um, meanwhile, I got a job at Cafe Troppo in Glebe, um, which Ken Bergen owned at the time. And lots of people have been through through that little institution, you know, Barbara Sweeney, um, Michelle Cranston, I think. You know, there's a, there's a group of us women that Ken Bergen steered along the way. And I was three months into working there while still trying to find a place to go overseas and at least feeling grateful that I'd had some experience working in an actual kitchen. Um, and... My mother asked her cousin if she knew anywhere and she happened to know Gay Bilson very well. And Gay Bilson said, no, I don't really know anywhere overseas, but I do need an apprentice. And so I had always loved Burrell Watazine. I'd been there for a couple of um, meals. My um, aunt's husband had been to boarding school with Tony Bilson, so there'd always been this very vague, tenuous um, relationship. I remember when I was at university, I walked out onto a newsagent on Victoria Street and I found $100 and I went back into the newsagent and I said, look, if anyone... If anyone um, comes in saying they lost the money, here's my phone number and can they call me? And I let it go about a month. And then after that, it was like, well, you know what? I've got $100. And what did I do with it? I booked a table at Burrell Waters Inn. <laughs> so it was kind of one of those first, oh, look, it's meant to be moments. And, um, yeah, I ended up spending two and a half years there. Do you have any stories of what it was like working in that kitchen with Gay Bilson and Yanni Chris? It was intense, um, but in a really good way. The days were long, so the restaurant was only open Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And Sunday we just did lunch, but Friday and Saturday we did lunch and dinner. Um, once a month on a Thursday, you'd be the person that would pick up the van from Gill and drive all around Sydney to all the different providors and pick up the van, pick up all the food for the weekend and then drive up to Barara unload it. You'd meet Doug, the boatman, um, who was also an amazing potter and fluent in Japanese and the boat driver and um, the caretaker. And you'd unload all the stuff. And then in the afternoon, you'd drive back, but you'd be back on that Burrell Waters wharf um, at about 7 or 8am on Friday morning. And you'd get straight into the kitchen and service in the heady days, service the Friday night, you'd work all day. You'd stop for an hour at about six and then the first boat would be called and so everyone would scurry back into the kitchen and the last meal would probably go out around 11 and that was the dessert. And then you'd clean down and you'd often prep till one or two o'clock in the morning and then you'd sit down and have a drink. <laughs> And then all the waiters would um, uh, unroll their mattresses and they would sleep on the restaurant floor 
which wasn't a bad bedroom designed by Glenn Merkett. And then there was a few of us that um, had um, bunks in the back room. And, you know, um, that movie, oh, uh, The Big Chill? And there's a scene in The Big Chill where they're in the kitchen and slowly all the, all the guests wake up slowly and it's like slow motion and they walk into the kitchen and they, you know, some grab coffee and some, you know, whatever. And the morning after at Burrell was like that. All the chefs would get up early and um, a chef friend and I, Sean, would get up an hour before and we'd make ourselves breakfast and poached eggs and sit there and really just have a meal together, which in hindsight, is really quite lovely. And then slowly the rest of the kitchen staff would come in and then one by one at around 10 or quarter to 11, the actual restaurant doors would open and the wait staff would emerge and make juice and coffee. And then all of a sudden they'd go and have showers and they'd all become incredibly handsome and clean and affable and be ready for the first boat. <laughs> So it was pretty crazy. Very early on in your career, you opened a Pine Log restaurant in uh, the central coast of New South Wales. With the knowledge that you have now, looking back, what what, what was it like and the challenges and, and what, what what were you like then? Well, <laughs> that's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, 1991. Um, so I was fresh out of Barawa. Um, I'd never actually run a business. Um, I had really high aspirations of, um, well, no, I'd been influenced by simple things like, you know, there I was at the RSL club, but I was serving my chips and salads in pillivet bowls because that's what we did at Barara. Um, But, you know, it was still fish and chips and it was still, you know, steak and chips and then gradually incorporated other things. Um it was a very inexpensive venue um, and we gradually, you know, built up a bit of a, a local reputation. Um, I wish I'd saved more money then and bought a little block of land on the central coast all the way back then. I wish my business now had been better. Um, but um, what have I learned? Oh, you know, it's I was just... I just did it. Again, it was by accident. The contract came up and a little old lady walked past the house and said, oh, you know, they need a caterer down at the local RSL. And I was like, okay, I'll give it a go. And then, you know, I started as a contract caterer and then I took over the restaurant and, and I'd ring Howard, you know, my then husband on a Friday or a Saturday night. And this was after the drink driving had come in and I'd ring him and on a Friday night, you know, it was like, how was your night? And at Barrow and he'd be like, oh, you know, we did 20 people. And I would have done like 120. <laughs> it was like, and so eventually he, you know, stopped doing his shifts at Burrell because by that stage we were living, well, we were living in Kilcare, obviously. And um, he came and joined me. But I started as me and one other person in the kitchen, David Farnham, who um, had worked for the previous caterer. And, you know, I ended up with about eight because it got really busy in summer. Wow. Lots of fish and chips. <laughs> You've worked with um, some incredible people from that have influenced the culinary landscape in Australia, from Maggie Beer to Christine Manfield, Marty Boats, David Thompson. What sort of influence did they have on you? A lot. <laughs> um, lots. And all of them are to this day, you know, I really would consider close close friends, you know, and that's a lovely thing to be able to say about people that were your mentors and that you've worked for and respected. Um, so Gay and Yanni, I mean, that was, you know, I still think the food that when you look back on pictures and read recipes of the food that they were serving at Burrell back then, to this day for me it's still timeless. Um, it was um, just simplicity on the plate but with technique and flavour. So I learnt that there but I also learnt about food writers. My mum had always collected, um, you know, had always had Elizabeth David and Robert Carrier and all sorts of, you know, obviously the mastering of art of, of French cooking. So I'd always been around cookbooks but the Barawa days, that's when I was introduced to food writers like Claudia Roden. Michella Hazan, Paula Wolfert, Jane Grigson, you know, um, and of course Alice Waters and more and more and more and more. And that's when I started collecting books and reading about um, food that has a journey that stayed with me. That journey continued, you know, both with 
Chris and Maggie. Chris is incredibly organised in the kitchen. I mean, so so was Yanni, you know, like the professionalism and the organisation and the technical side of it. Maggie is, everybody knows what Maggie's like. She's amazing and she's such a fantastic cook, but she's also quite freelance. (laughs) And so cooking with her just completely, it was all about, you know, right here in the moment, what does it taste like? Oh, no, it needs this. Oh, no, it needs that. And David Thompson and subsequently Marty Boats's cooking was very much like that. So there were real parallels between the influence of cooking for Maggie Beer and with Maggie Beer and for David Thompson and with Marty Boats that I think is probably one of my, well, there's no biggest takeout, but that's a really significant takeout because it's just that just keep tasting just keep adjusting. You know, yesterday's tomato might not be as ripe as tomorrow's tomato. Today's apple might be sweeter. You know, all the little variations that occur in produce that you don't, can't read in a recipe. You just have to keep tasting. Bird cow fish has had many incarnations, uh, but but started in Balmain. T- tell us about the creation of that and, and what impact it had over your career. Um, so I had one son at that stage. It was just Luke who was about one, maybe going – no, no, he would have been going on two. I'd been at Sailor's Tie for a year, so I'd eased back into um, restaurant working. Um, and I, you know, Howard was really keen to open a restaurant <laughs> and I was a chef, so I was like, okay. <laughs> So we found this little, you know, corner position in Balmain and it was great. It was small. It was BYO. Um, Marty ended up um, coming to work with me as the co-chef for the first year at Bird Cowfish. And um, it was, it was, it was such a celebration of simple produce and simple cooking. Um, And I mean, I remember Terry Durack and I still use it now as my hashtag in the review. He um, just described it as good, simple, delicious. And that's all it was. We weren't trying to be clever or creative. It was just using, um, you know, the, the, the good cooking skills and really trying to seek out, you know, the best produce. It was back in the day when, you know, the, the the guy delivering the ocean trout would walk in the door with it, you know, because you'd been up the road at Tetsuya's and the beautiful chickens from Nicholas Foods. And you had these really close relationships with really small suppliers and distributors, you know, the salad greens that I used to get. It was, it was it, I mean, you know, it, the farm to table, not quite, but it was quite like that, and which was very time consuming, but um, immensely rewarding. And so that was sort of the, the continuation of having worked for Maggie as well, because, you know, being in a farm kitchen, I mean, people literally would turn up with bunches of asparagus and strawberries they've just picked. So it was as close as I could get to replicating that wonderful experience that I'd had at the pheasant farm. Bird carfish eventually um, emerged again in uh, in Surrey Hills and also a version at the farmer's markets too. Uh, what, what, what sort of impact um, did those, uh, did that have on, on you and the connection to producers? Um, firstly, what we started at Balmain in terms of suppliers continued um, in Surrey Hills Um, and at the same time I was also um, a New South Wales judge for the Delicious Produce Awards. So there was, you know, ongoing connections with producers through a variety of streams, which was um, fantastic. You know, we used to clean the the benches down at the end of the night, not every week, but, you know, and get in whole animals from feather and bone and it would be like the the staff after after work staff <laughs> gathering where we'd gather around the bench and break down this whole animal um so i always <laughs> i always seem to if if i can make things harder i will <laughs> And so the challenges of working like that um, were enormous. And then, of course, um, there was, I went to Terra Madre, which was very much all about producers. And that was back in 2008, I think. And um, um, 
actually, no, it was after that. It was in, yeah, it was 2008. Anyway, um, it was amazing because there I was suddenly in Turin and it was all about supply, uh, you know, producers. Um, but then what that also meant was that I made connections with lots of the people from Australia that also went to Terra Madre at the same time. And one of those was Auntie Beryl. Um, who went on to um, found Yamadama down in um, Redfern, where the two good um, company is now based. And she, they were just setting up the first carriage works market that Christmas. And um, I was asked if I'd like to do a stall, um, as many of us were. And so I went down there with all my pan fort and my Christmas cakes and all of that sort of stuff, and it was great. But then I was asked, would you like to continue doing the market? And so I went back with my jams and my pan fort and not Christmas cakes. Um, and, of course, this, you know, this wasn't quite the same level of demand for those items outside of Christmas. Um, so I could just kind of looked around and it's just like, you know, there's a lot of people here that are either working here or coming here. So let's just do some hot food. Um, so started doing the, you know, the croque madame, which was the crooked madame, which was our version of the um, the croque madame with the egg and the barbecue sauce and then introduced porridge in winter and birch and muesli and, you know, went from me with one other person doing it to oh, sometimes having three serving and three cooking. So it was a little powerhouse of a stall. <laughs> And, of course, I baked all these cakes and would, you know, cook all day Friday and um, get up at 3 a.m. on Saturday and bake everything off fresh and then load the car. Um, so what affected both of those bird cowfish, sorry, hills and the market have completely and utterly exhausting. <laughs> um, but, you know, just fantastic. Like, you know, I think I'm far enough away from both of them now to have recovered to say I remember them fondly. It's a bit like, you know, childbirth. Oh, it, just, it wasn't as bad as I think I remember. <laughs> so, yeah, amazing. But the carriage works especially because in restaurants I'd always been on the other side of the wall in the kitchen. Or um, Bird Cowfish um, Balmain, we had an open kitchen. But um, after that, I'd always been behind the wall. But what I really loved about Carriage Works is you were right in the heart of it, you know, and you were writing all your customers' names on those bags for the croque madames. And we were selling sometimes up to 250 just toasted sandwiches. So you really got to know people and the friendships that I have from those customers today are some of my closest friends. And, you know, it's just lovely that you can really still keep making really good friends on onwards and upwards, you know. Um, so, yeah, really fond memories and it was a very special time, both from customers and staff, actually. All my staff are really close friends as well. Was there, was there a moment or a period of time where you really found your voice on the plate and you, you knew what direction you were headed? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, in fact, I th I think it's just kind of sometimes in a way, you know, it's almost gotten a bit harder. You know, I'm so inspired by so many people that are cooking and particularly now in this world of social media, you see what they're doing all the time. You know, Matt at Esther, Josh at um, um, St Peter, um, so many of them and, um, you know, sometimes I just sit there and look at their stuff and go, oh, my God, I feel like I just can't cook. Um, and then, and then you know, I just come come back to my basics about, well, that's, that's their thing and I've got my thing and my food is just good, simple, delicious. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, I, I just, I think probably I don't, because I don't have a restaurant at the moment, I don't have that pressure on me of what does my food look like do you know what I mean? It's it's more I'm cooking. My food looks like, I suppose, more just what I like to cook and eat at home with friends and family, which has pretty much always been what I've done. Um, but if I can do it better, um, I'm always looking for ways. But um, there's not quite that pressure at the moment. But who knows? <laughs> you, you do an incredible amount of research and really cook from the heart. Where, where, does the, where do the ideas come from? 
for you when you're creating a dish? Um, just always from what's what's in season now and what's at its peak. And then I usually start by by looking at what's at the market or, you know, researching, you know, what, what should be around at the moment. Um, usually it starts at the market. And then um, and then starting to connect the ingredients together. So um, looking for those natural food marriages, whether it's just across plants like tomatoes and basil is an obvious one, um, but then starting to think about, you know, um, sort of what meats might complement other meats. So, for example, this Christmas I'm, we're doing, amongst other things, but we're just going to do a really simple roast fillet of beef as one of our meat courses. And beautiful beetroots are in season right now. And so there's those sort of um, earthy but sweet flavours of beetroot that will just complement so beautifully a rare roasted piece of um, rich meat. So I sort of try and think what's going to complement something else. Sometimes there's similarities in the ingredients that they go together, but otherwise it's sometimes it's about the contrast. There's a lot of talk about um, cooking with the seasons, um, but why should people cook with the seasons? What's, what, is, what does that mean to you? Um, what it means to me is um, what's – freshest and most plentiful. Um, it also usually means that it's been um, produced close by. <laughs> I mean, if you're buying food that's not in season, it's come from somewhere else and it's probably taken a while to get here. So, you know, I tend to avoid that. Um, from a, you know, a lot of people complain about the the price of food and think that food's very expensive and they say, you know, we can't eat that because that's too expensive. But I think also if you eat seasonally, that's when food in certain, you know, food is more abundant in that particular in that particular um, genre. So, you know, when tomatoes are in the peak of season, there's, there's more of them. There's generally a better market price. Same with asparagus, all those sorts of things. So I think it's also just a really great way to to steer your finances um, by eating at a time when food is more abundant. Um, and also food cooked, uh, food grown in a season. I mean, there's a reason why that food grows in that season because it's the best growing season for it. So it's also generally food that will taste um, at, its, at its best and its prime because that's where and when it's, it naturally um, grows best. You do all sorts of things these days, but tell us about uh, this letterpress machine that you have. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the letterpress is a lovely story. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a sign of my mental fragility. Um, the letterpress. So when I closed Bird Cowfish in Surrey Hills, this lovely woman turned up with a press. Um, print of a fig that she'd made and she gave it to me and it was a letterpress and her name was Tanya Bingelli and she um, then I got back in touch with her and when Marty started doing his um, lunches out at what's now the cook shed but in the original house that he lived in up on the hill when we'd clear out all the rooms of this old house that he was living in and we'd fill it with tables and maybe 30 people would come <laughs> and we'd feed them and I asked Tanya if she could um, print some menus and so she did more letterpress for us and then I'd hand write the actual menu she'd just do the prints and then I kept all those menus and she always gave me all the, 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 the runs that didn't quite work, you know, the, the, the ink hadn't quite lined up. So I went on to cut them up and they actually became the labels for all the food that I sold down at Carriage Works. So the letterpress continued and then um, I had a bit of an accident in March this year and about two weeks after that, I saw that Tanya posted that she was um, – needing to find a new home for her letterpress because she was moving to Berlin. <laughs> wow. And I looked at that and, you know, I was at a point where I was just like, I don't know what's going on. Um, but I sort of on Instagram, I just said to her, what about me? 
And and the other connection, of course, was that um, Chez Panisse has always been the restaurant in San Francisco by Alice Waters. has always been a huge inspiration for me. And all of Alice Waters' cookbooks mostly and then all the posters and when I've been to Chez Panisse, the menus for all um, designed or at least all um, um yeah, designed with the letterpress print work done by Patricia Curtin. So I've got letterpress pictures for um, Chez Panisse hanging all over my house, not to mention all the books. So, um, so Tanya came back to me and said, okay. And so the next week I arranged and I took Joel, my youngest son, um, to go and visit her studio in um, North Sydney. And we walked in and there was all her stuff and all the letters and this beautiful machine. And Tanya and I both had a bit of a cry over it and she was like, oh, it's so special to me, you know, and she was really wanting to some, find someone to take it. I've never done letterpress printing, although I have done a lot of screen printing. So, you know, I have a screen printing background. Um, and so I just kind of looked at Joel and said, you know, what do you reckon? And so I said, yes. So the next week I arranged um, to go and collect it, which involved getting a very special man called David who specialises with his crane and his truck in moving heavy things because the letterpress weighs 500 kilos. Um, not to mention all the cabinets because she was flying out to Germany the, sort of like literally the next day. It was basically a one price for everything. So I bought a whole letterpress studio. <laughs> the letterpress is kind of like the beauty. <laughs> but I've also bought um, thousands of letterpress letters that Joel's girlfriend has been meticulously sorting out and naming and cataloguing. So now I've turned what was my study in the front room downstairs into basically it's a letterpress studio. <laughs> It's quite hilarious and it doesn't even have the letterpress in it because that's in the other room next door because it's so big. <laughs> so it's something that's – and I haven't really used it. The the guys, are, you know, Joel and Sinead have been using it. I haven't got there, um, but I'm hoping to. Um, but I've got lots of ideas and, um, you know, I've done a little bit of lino print because there's lots of lino print you can do as well as the calligraphy. But, um yeah, you know, it's a bit like the whole how did I get into cooking, you know, and the story of loving Barrow or what is in. This whole letterpress thing, it's like I just couldn't not do it. Recently you launched uh, your website, which is a pretty easy to find because it's your name. Um, but one of the fascinating things about it is the discussion about cooking beyond the recipe. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think um, what I wanted to do or what I meant by that was – um, there's a lot of recipes available out there, you know, quite readily available, especially on the internet. And people um, often follow a recipe and it just says do this, this and this. And for me it goes back to all those sort of lessons that I've learnt over the years about tasting your food and, you know, really thinking about like what I said before about, you know, yesterday's tomatoes might not be as sweet as today's tomatoes and what do you need to do to make it, you know, taste better um so i really i really want to fill the gaps and the the journals that, that i'm putting on there whether or not it's how to use you know leftover bread or you know um how to you know um how to make a mayonnaise or that type of thing um it's really about providing a little bit more detail and it, and it's it's about teaching people kind of how to cook, um, not just this is what you can cook, but really wanting to deliver the, the nuances of <clears throat> how you can actually cook better, how you can use everything, you know, and, I mean, that's a really big thing at the moment and lots of people are doing a really good job about sharing the, the, the no-waste philosophy um, because, for me, it's not just about no-waste um, but as and with many people other, it's, it's, it's also about flavour building. You know, if you save those juices from the roast chicken, you know, last night and, of course, all the bones for stock or whatever, but even just those juices, and it might only be a few tablespoons, but the next day you're making a sauce and it's like, oh, I've got those juices, you know, and you just add it to it or, you know, you squeeze your, your lemons but you don't put the lemon rind in the compost. You chop it up and stuff the, the, the chicken 
with it the next day or you um, candy it and make, you know, make stuff for cakes or sweets. So it's also, again, I suppose it comes back to, you know, cooking in season. It's like, well, how do you get the most out of everything? And it's, and it's really about, you know, cooking, cooking shouldn't be as expensive as some people think it is. And I think a lot of the the thoughts that people fear around cooking or spending money on food is probably just not knowing what to do with everything, um, which is, I think, something chefs do more naturally. And I think generally people are much better better at it now, but I still think that there's a lot of stuff that people can hang on to um, to create an element of that next meal. This time of year, a lot of people cook for more people than they're used to cooking for. You've had an incredible ability to cook for lots of people and create the most extraordinary feasts. Do you have any advice for what it takes to feed a lot of people? Keep it simple. (laughs) Keep it really simple. My Christmas, we're doing Christmas Day um, this weekend. We're doing it um, earlier than the actual Christmas Day. And we're starting with a ham. But the ham is actually just going to be on the bench just so people could slice off a piece and have it with some bread. And I've been accumulating chutneys over the last few weeks that I haven't made because I haven't got time, I haven't got the energy actually. Um, But that's the first course. So that's ham done. (laughs) And all you have to do is glaze it. It's too too easy. And then, like I said, we're doing beef fillet and I'm going to um, roast some whole ocean trout. The trick will be in we're just going to have steamed potatoes, but they're going to be the most beautiful gourmet potatoes that I buy down at Carriage Works. Um, I've got some horseradish that I'm just going to mix fresh with some beautiful creme fraiche. There'll be a beautiful green salad um, just with a very simple dressing. So when you think about everything I've just said, there's not actually that much preparation. There's a bit of cooking because I've got to roast the beef and I'll season it with, you know, maybe even one of those amazing Olsen sea salt marinades or whatever. But um, it's there's enough in the cooking that I try and eliminate the preparation side of it because that's when you just get, you, by the time you've done all the prep, it gets exhausted. Or what I am also doing is making some mince tarts, which don't have mince in them, um, but just have the the fruit and I'm mixing it up with prunes and candied kumquat peel um, that I've made. And so I'm also like there's a recipe, but again, I'm actually also using what I've got. That's one less trip to the shop because the recipe is saying I need to have sultanas and currants and things. It's like, no, I've got prunes in the cupboard. I've got some raisins. I'll, I'll do the same weights and it will actually be something that's still really quite beautiful and really delicious, but also I can do that in advance. So, you know, I mowed the lawn two days ago. That's me getting ready for Christmas. So I've started the countdown, you know. It's like start with the hardest jobs first <laughs> and then by the time the day arrives, hopefully all you have to do is just a little bit of cooking. You've been involved in some of the most extraordinary restaurants in Australia's culinary history and created some as well. Have you ever had any thoughts about dipping your toe back into the hospitality game? Um, so I don't think I've ever left the hospitality game. (laughs) Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to run a business again. Um, the the bird cuffish Surrey Hills was incredibly stressful. Um, you know, that was at the same time that my marriage ended. Um, you know, I had two children in high school, I, I was running, we had the carriage works market um, and, um, you know, no, I don't really want to, glad I did it all, well, not all of it, but I'm, it, it, <laughs> um, um, I don't want to be under that much pressure. Um, what I would, one of the ideas I, I would like to have, and I've talked about it for ages, is to do salon. Um, you've been to my house hut, so can you imagine setting up a couple of tables of 10 and just feeding 20 people at a time? And that would be really lovely. And whether or not, you know, it's I used to do um, food writers' dinners at 
bird cow fish in Surrey Hills. And I love that idea. You know, tonight's menu is Michella Hazan or Elizabeth David or whatever. And I'd like to do that again. Um, and of course, all the menus would be printed on my letterpress, you know. And um, then we were talking, I was talking with friends the other day because don't we all just want to go away? <laughs> and I don't want to travel overseas for two years because I know that half those pilots haven't even been in a, you know, in a playroom of how to fly so I want to stay put for a while until we've all learned how to do it again a simulator that's what it's called a simulator um so I just want to stay put until they've all you know um got their their mojo back um but I'd love to you know the idea of jumping in the car and maybe driving to Melbourne and stopping along the way. I just read Annie Smithers' book, you know, A Recipe for a Kinder Life, and, and you know, we had a chat um, afterwards and she's like, come and, come and do a collab. And I was just like, oh, my God, that would be amazing. And, you know, to, to sort of, you know, if anybody would have me, to pinpoint a few ways, like maybe do one heading to Victoria and then another one up to Byron Bay, separate trips but just stopping along the way and cooking with, you know, chefs who are family, friends, having fun, um, really, you know, um, treating people. I think hospitality, um, like I said, I never, I've never given up hospitality because I think it's um, – at, at its core, and lots of your um, interviewees have mentioned this, it's it's about looking after people. So, you know, you do that, you know, with every meal that you cook potentially. Um, but I'd love to do that again. And I remember Lucio saying, I think it was one of his final lunches, that, um, you know, it's not, it's not service because you're looking after people, but in actual fact he always felt like he was the lucky one because he could just see the joy that he was bringing and how happy people were and the pleasure. And, and that's it, you know, when you have a big party and you look around and everyone's having a good time. I mean, what more could you ask for? But it was, we were talking about me hitting the road and Joel came up with this idea, you know, you could call it Cirque de Herbert because Herbert in French is pronounced Herbert. So, you know, who knows? I may hit the road and do a Cirque de Herbert. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You've had the most incredible influence um, on so many people in this country and, and um, given them a full belly and a happy heart. What, what is it that you love about what you do? I love the – I love restaurants. I love – or even carriage works. You know, I love – being in that hive of, of people working together. Like it's so collaborative. It's so supportive. I've never worked in a bad kitchen and the best friends I've ever made have been people that I've met or some of the best friends, especially in the last 20 to 30 years, are all people that I've worked with or met through um, food. And, um, you know, just buzz and it's so funny now because my younger son who's 21 um is working in a restaurant you know just started as a restaurant job COVID hit lost a job at the restaurant you know was studying at uni and you know he he had a tough year like lots of people and I just said to him you just got to find something that you really love and that you're really passionate yeah. about it little did I know it was going to be working in a restaurant <laughs> He's not cooking. He's into cocktails. But I can just see him. He's buying. I've got the best bar you could possibly want. Um, and he's just accumulating all these books. But what I love most, he wakes up in the morning. What's the first thing he does? Grabs a book, reads about it, goes into work, loves his job, loves the people. Um, so, yeah, it's just something. There's just something about being behind the curtain in a restaurant and being the people that make it happen that just is really, really lovely and exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alex, I know there's so many more stories that you have to share um, and I think we need to catch up again down the track a little bit further, but it's been an absolute honour to have you on Deep in the Weeds today in the lead up to Christmas. Have an amazing Christmas and please keep in touch and we'll catch up soon. Thanks, Huck, and same to you and I'll see you soon. <laughs> All right, lots of love. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. 
Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.